Hello, everyone, and thanks for joining us this afternoon. I'm Marcus Weisgerber from Defense One, and I want to welcome our next uh, keynote speaker today, Frank Kendall, the Secretary of the Air Force, uh, somebody I got to know very well back when he was the head of acquisition at the Pentagon during the Obama administration. Secretary Kendall, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Marcus. Good to be with you. So Secretary Kendall and I are going to have a conversation for the next 20, 25 minutes, but we want you, our viewers, to also be part of the discussion. There's a chat feature on the right side of your screen. Feel free to put your questions in there, and I will get to as many of them as I can uh, in, the time that, in the time that we have. So Secretary Kendall, I wanted to just start off. I, I, I know um, I want to talk about some of your priorities and then dive a bit deeper into talk about China, uh, Air Force modernization, and then the budget, the continuing resolution. Uh, but first, uh, I want—I understand you have six imperatives right now as secretary that you're, you're, you know, kind of your top priorities. Can you maybe walk us through a little bit of, of how, how you're thinking about them? Sure. It's actually seven now. Uh, we added one just the other day. The, the operational imperatives, as I'm calling them, started out as some uh, problems I felt we needed to do more anal analysis of and develop a deeper understanding to drive what we acquire, drive how we modernize. Um, and they're, they're driven in large part by the fact that we have uh, pacing challenges that we have to address now. China, which I've been talking about for about a dozen years, is a increasing threat to the US's ability to project power. But also with events that we're seeing fold out and uh, play out in real time, uh, situation in Europe right now, uh, with uh, the aggressive behavior potentially by Russia. So when you look at those two possible sources of a conflict, uh, you recognize right away that it's a very uh, dense, compressed environment with, uh, I'll call it a many on many problem, a difficult operational problem involving modern forces, the sort of thing we haven't actually done for a very long time. And both countries have, to some degree been modernizing their forces while we've been doing counterinsurgencies against much less capable forces, uh, at least in the, in the, in the respect to conventional forces. So, uh, what do we need to do to get at that? So that's a very big part of what I'm doing. There are a number of other things that are happening uh, in the Department of the Air Force right now. We're getting the Air Force and the Space Force and the Secretariat aligned. Uh, there, I have a series of management initiatives that are more about how we do business and about efficiencies and about improving our ability to function as an institution. So those are going on as well. But the operational uh, imperatives, the seven of them, kind of cover the things that if you thought about it for a few minutes and you're worried about the two potential high-end fights that I talked about that you, you'd need to address. It starts out with getting our space rover battle right. Uh, space is now a contested environment. We recognize in the Obama administration that uh, we had to change the way we approach space. We couldn't operate with impunity there anymore. Uh, and we've made a fair amount of progress in the intervening years moving towards something that's more resilient. Uh, more effective in a threatened, contested uh, situation. So the first one, though, is about making sure we've got that right. Uh, we're going to bring the Space Development Agency into the Air Force pretty soon. They've definitely taken some steps in what's very much the right direction, uh, distributed architectures that are uh, more resilient, as well as capitalizing on commercial uh, applications. We've done some of the same sorts of things in our planning in the Space Force. Uh, Jay Raymond and his team, I think, have done a really good job there. But we've got to pull all that together. Uh, we've got to work with our friends in the intelligence community and look at what they're doing and how that fits in and then how all of it contributes to what's called JADC squared. So there's a lot to do in terms of getting space right, if you will, making sure we're doing the right things there. Uh, switching kind of the other end of the situation to the Air Force, we've got to make sure our air bases are res resilient. Uh, we depend on forward air bases to support all of our tactical aircraft, basically our fighters. Uh, and the, the Chinese and others, the Russians also have been building mechanisms to attack those bases. So we got to figure out what mix of hardening, deception, uh, dispersion, uh, uh, something we call agile combat employment, uh, and other measures we could take are, are going to be enough to give us the capability that we need there. So that, that's on the list. Uh, ABMS is on the list, Advanced Battle Management System. And what we need to do there is focus it more than I think it's been in the past on operational return on investment. Uh, it, it, the idea that we want to we want to pay for the the things that fall under that concept that really pay off highly in, in an operational sense. And that linkage hasn't been clear so far. So we've got an effort going on to, to, to find that and get on with that. 
Um, we've got one which is in an area basically of targeting uh, against mobile targets in particular. You know, if we're going to be in a many-on-many -many situation, we got to sort out a lot of targets in a hurry uh, and get those that information to the people who can engage those targets and preferable, preferably from a longer range. So how do we do that? It's a combination of space centers and airborne centers, uh, and it's a number of things that connect them all together. There's a tight coupling between that one and uh, ABMS and JADC squared and, and the space initiative. But the, uh, uh, at the end of the day, the thing you have to do first is get timely, accurate targeting quality information that you can then process and do other things with. So how we get ground moving target and aerial moving target indicator uh, uh, tracks established is, 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 is the focus of that next one. Uh, we have one that looks at how we're going to go to war. If we have to go to war against a high-end competitor who's thought carefully about where we might be vulnerable as we, as we effectively mobilize, one of the things that we depend upon to get our forces into battle, uh, and there's a long stream of them. There are things that go all the way back to the industrial base and the supply chain. Uh, there are things that are about our logistics systems, our personnel systems, our transportation systems. So we're going to take a hard look at all of that and look at where it might potentially be, be more vulnerable than we can tolerate and take some steps to address that. Um, there are the, the two ones that are built around new programs. Uh, the first one is uh, moving forward to operationalize uh, unmanned combat aircraft in the, in the fighter category. Uh, basically, the idea here is that you have one or more, I would say nominally up to five, let's say, uh, unmanned combat aircraft that are controlled by a single modern manned aircraft. And NGAD uh, is the one we're looking at principally, but you could also do that with F-22 potentially or F-35. And the idea is that the, the manned aircraft is essentially calling plays, and he's using those other unmanned combat aircraft basically as a formation to do things that make sense tactically. This opens up a whole bunch of opportunities. Um, but the exact mix of that and what you would carry on those unmanned combat aircraft and um, um, what kinds of plays you would pre-program, if you will, for the, the, the operator to select are all things we have to go sort out. So we're, we're getting that one started. We're doing something very similar, and this is the new one added to my original six, is with the B-21. I've talked about this a little bit already, but uh, the B-21 is a very expensive aircraft. Uh, has a certain payload range. But we'd like to amplify that capability. It has the ability to penetrate, which is valuable. But uh, individual B B B21s are going to be very expensive. So what we want is something that can go I mean, uh, operate with it. I want to say a company it necessarily, where it, the tactics are very much to be determined. But we're going to sort that out and think about unmanned combat aircraft and how to network them together under the control of an operator in a B21 to operate again as a formation in some loose sense. Uh, again, against a uh, modern enemy. So that's the next one. And there's, there's a fair amount of analysis work to do. I've moved my analysis shop, uh, which was A9, over into the Secretariat to support both the Air Force and Space Force. We also have the Warfighting Analysis uh, uh, organization that Jay Raymond has established working on this as well. So we're, we're, we're moving towards making sure we're going in the right direction. There's a lot of emphasis, and there has been for the last several years, on moving fast. Uh, moving fast is important, but going in the right direction is pretty important too. And so we want to make sure we do the work up front to make sure we're going in the right direction. And once we've done that, then we're going to get to meaningful opportunity, operational capability as quickly as we can. Uh, I, I've recently looked at all of my modernization programs with the two service chiefs, and some of them are structured to do that and some are not. So we're going to be looking at ways to make sure uh, that all of them are guided by the general principle of getting to meaningful military capability as quickly as possible. One or two is something often isn't uh, meaningful. It's interesting and it helps you learn, but it, it doesn't get you where you want to be operation. So I want to unpack a lot of what's in there. China B-21, just first off, you did you did mention uh, at, the, at the top Russia, and I, I, I actually really didn't have too, mu too much even involving Russia on here. Have the events in recent weeks, has that changed the way you're thinking strategically about Russia? Um, you know, it's all we've heard from the Pentagon a lot the last, you know, four, five, five ish years is China, China, China. Um, is there more of an emphasis on Russia in, in, inside the Pentagon these days? Uh, Russia has never been off the list. We've always had a going back to, I think, when Secretary Carter was here, it was it was China, Russia, you know, it, 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 Iran, North Korea and violent extremist groups. That five. That, that's that's still the list. Basically, people were worried about. 
the 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 competitor that I've been worried about the most for a long time is China, uh, largely because of its economic cut. Uh, China just has the the resources to be much more formidable of a competitor. It has global ambitions. Uh, Russia may, in in some frame, have similar ambitions, but doesn't have anything near the capacity that China does. Uh, its 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 economy is you know a very small fraction of the size of the economy of China today, and it's not really growing. Uh, but China, but Russia does have a large number of nuclear weapons. Russia does have the tendency to be rather aggressive in its neighborhood, uh, and it's obviously an authoritarian regime, which which poses some problems to us in a number of fronts. So we can't ignore Russia. We can't ignore those other threats that I mentioned either. But the the focus and the emphasis, I think Secretary Austin said this uh, when he spoke out at the Reagan Forum about the pacing challenge being China, and that was guiding a lot of what's going into the national defense strategy that we're working on. So, but Russia is obviously capable of uh, aggressive actions, and we're watching with a lot of concern what's happening outside Ukraine right now. Um, uh, the people in that part of Europe, in particular, are worried about Russia's uh, intentions in the future and what they're doing. Uh, we're trying to send Russia a very strong message, I think, from the administration and from with our allies that uh, anything that they might do there that was aggressive would be a grave mistake on their part. Uh, hopefully they'll get that message because I think the consequences for Russia would be much more severe than they might they might realize. Uh, <clears throat> so we're not we're not ignoring Russia. We never have. And it is one of the two higher end, if you will, competitors that we're, we're focused on. But of the two, China represents a much greater and longer term strategic threat, as far as I'm concerned. So build, building on your comments about China, just a few days ago out at the Reagan Forum, you talked about how uh, you're in an arms race with China for qu quality, not just quantity. So what are some areas where the Air Force needs to, I guess, up its game to make sure it stays qualitatively ahead of China? I just gave you the list of seven. <laughs> we're, we're, uh, those are all kind of built around that problem. The, the, uh, uh, we need to get on with some of the modernization we have underway. Uh, F-35 certainly, B-21 certainly. Uh, those are pretty mature programs. There's a program called JATAM, Next Generation Air-to-Air -air Missile we need. Uh, there, are, there are things we need to do in space uh, that make space more resilient. So we've, we've, we've got a long list. Uh, we need to focus JADC squared, as I mentioned earlier, or ABMS, our version of that. Uh, and we need to link, uh, one of the things I need to do in particular uh, uh, as part of the space order battle discussion and part of the ABMS discussion is, is provide services to the, to the other military departments, to the other services. Space is largely an area in which we, we, we have to contest it now. It's gonna, we're gonna have to be resilient. But what we do from space is largely provide services to others. Uh, to the Air Force, or the, the Air Force is a separate service, same department, but also to the Navy and the Army. So we, we and the Marine Corps, we have to work uh, with those services and, and through the Joint Staff to make sure we're doing everything we, we can to support the joint operations overall. It's almost a unique characteristic of what we do in space that an awful lot of what we do up there is, is things we provide to others. That, that's also a characteristic to some degree of the Air Force because we provide mobility, for example, uh, to the rest of the force. So when, when, when do you, you know, you, you've, uh, when, when do you estimate China being able to reach parity with the Air Force? I know, f I know focusing on, you know, going fast on a lot of these modernization issues is, is a really big deal for you. Uh, you know, is this 2025? Is it 2030? Is it beyond that? Uh, you, how are you viewing that? I think that's a bad metric. I, or I, I don't think parity is what you should think about. I think you should think about um, because it tends to give you a kind of accounting for the two sides. We have asymmetric problems, okay? China is trying to uh, keep us out of their part of the world so they can conduct whatever operations they want to conduct where they are and intimidate their neighbors. We want to be able to project power a long way away to China's, uh, to where our allies are, you know, to people that we work with that are close friends and allies in the Western Pacific. So we have very different problems and they're acquiring things that are designed to achieve their objective. We need to acquire things that defeat that and achieve our objective. And I, I've been watching China modernize for a long time now. I started giving speeches about China's modernization in 2010. Uh, that was 12 years ago almost. So um, they're working towards trying to achieve an advantage. We need to respond and try to ensure that we achieve an advantage. And it, it's, it's, um, it's something we haven't had since you know, the Cold War. It, it's a competitor who's 
actively and with with good resources working hard to fill things that are going to be better than the things we have and that then his mind can can give him a, make, a major advantage uh we're, we're doing the same right we have to think about that with a great sense of urgency and, and move forward quickly um we're in a, I, I, and i'm i'm going to say something that i don't think i've said before so reporters take note but we're in an era uh, where what would happen in a conflict between major powers is kind of uncertain. Um, and that uncertainty helps because it provides deterrence in a way, right? But the, the danger is that somebody should get the illusion or make the mistake that they have superiority and, and try to take advantage of that. So because of what we do that we don't, people don't know about in part, because of what we do that is untested in battle, and that's a lot of our stuff today against peer competitors, uh, uh, there are a lot of unknowns about what would happen in an actual conflict between two modern, well-equipped well, well, well military powers. Uh, I think that should give everybody pause, right? But anyway, we, we, we're, we try to be very smart about this. We try to invest in things that will give us advantage. We watch very carefully what uh, our two major concerns are doing and how they're modernizing. And it's reminiscent to some degree for me of the Cold War. I mean, if, you, if you'd asked me during the middle of the Cold War, when will there be parity? I said, well, we have different approaches to operate operational concepts. We have different approaches to building our forces. And if we get into a conflict, uh, is somebody going to dominate by a lot and by how much and why? Um, I don't think people can talk about that relatively right now, just because of the uncertainty associated with all that. When we went into the first Gulf War, and I was here for that, we anticipated that we were going to have 10 to 20,000 casualties. This is 1991. We had 275 or so, right? Um, we surprised ourselves. We certainly surprised the Iraqis, okay? Uh, and we surprised everybody else on the planet with how dominant we were. And the reason that China has been investing like it has is in part because it saw what we did 30 years ago when it's been trying to invest to defeat that kind of capability. So it's, it's on, the onus is on us to respond to that and do things that will give us confidence and will give us uh, heightened levels of deterrence. But if you'd ask me about parity in the middle of the Cold War uh, and what was going to happen in the full of the gap if the Chinese came through or the, excuse me, the Soviets at the time came, came through the full of the gap, uh, the answer, the honest answer would have been, it depends. It depends on a lot of conditions and things and the behavior of systems that have never really been tested in combat. And we're kind of back in that situation. So one of the one of the key parts of preparing for this fight that you inevitably hope never happens is, is partnerships in the Pacific, getting access to more for the Air Force would be more more airfields. Uh, can, can you talk to us about about that? How is how is that going? I know the Global Posture Review uh, it talks a lot about uh, uh, Australia and, and its partnership. Um, how, even beyond Australia, how, what, what do you need in terms of access? Um, we need the ability to implement what's called agile combat employment, what I talked about earlier. And we need to do that in partners. Sometimes we can do that on, on soil that the U.S. has some control of. In other cases, we have to do it in, comp in, 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 in concert with our, with our friends and allies. Uh, so that is being discussed and it is being worked and uh, exercises are going on to demonstrate the concept. We also have to make some investments, right? We have to acquire the logistic support that will actually support that. And we have to position that so that it's available and ready for us to use. Uh, to the extent that we can, we want to deny uh, uh, potential enemies the opportunity to figure out where we're going to be and how we're going to operate and when we're going to be there so that they can't target us effectively. So there are a number of things that have to be worked. I think it's fairly early stages right now uh, of fleshing all that out. But a, a, an important part of it is working with our allies. Uh, we, we want them to be as resilient as we are. So we need to do this together. It's not just the U.S. and something we can't do alone. Speaking of Australia, there was the AUKUS uh, pact signed uh, not too long ago, which will lead to them uh, getting nuclear submarines. Uh, there is a report out today that now they're going to buy uh, Black Hawk helicopters and Seahawk helicopters from the U.S. Uh, is, is there opportunity there? There's been people in Australia advocating to buy the B-21. Is the B-21 up for sale uh, for Australia, or should it be? You know, it's the first time anybody's expressed that thought to me, Marcus. Uh, I'm not going to give you an answer on the fly on that one. Uh, but you, you got my wheels turning, I will tell you. Um, I've had a lot of experience working with our, our partners in the Western Pacific, uh, Australia and Japan particularly, but also South Korea. Um, 
we we uh, we have very close relationships with with those countries, and we do a lot together with them. Uh, one program that Australia has been working on is a loyal wingman, you know, and that sounds a little bit like the concept I described earlier. And I'd be really interested in having some conversations with Australia about where that's going and how we might work together. Uh, we have some very close partners in other parts of the world that I'd like to work together with on some of these as well. Uh, we can pull our resources. We can we can improve our interoperability. We can get more advanced capability together. Uh, and I think we need to do that starting early in programs. And I'm, I'm including co-development. Uh, so as we move forward on uh, some of those projects that I talked to you about a moment ago, particularly the new programs I mentioned, uh, there are opportunities there that I think we want to explore. What, what you talked about earlier with the B, with the B twenty one and, and the uh, you know one the the price of it and two the, these these drones you want to fly fly with it how are the, how is that different from I guess what we've heard as being called Skyborg in uh, recent years and I know that was more tied to NGAD the new fighter uh, is it similar to, uh, is it the same it's related and I view both uh, loyal wingman program I mentioned potentially. Some work that my friend Heidi Shu, the Undersecretary for Research and Engineering, is doing, uh, the Skyward program, and and other things is uh, essentially feeders of technology into the program that I described. And we're we're in the process of figuring out how that all comes together, and how it's all focused. But what I'm describing is an acquisition program, a weapon system procurement program. Okay, so we're we're going to go from demonstrations and experiments. Uh, and technology maturation risk reduction into full-scale development or e engineering manufacturing development for production. And so we'll, we'll take a period of time to sort all that out, and then we're going to get on with building something we're going to field. Uh, it's, it's a commitment to going forward in a direction that we have been thinking about and experimenting with but hadn't committed to before. So that's, that's a major change, actually. Uh, and I've had enthusiastic support for these ideas from the leadership in the department and from others that I've talked to. Uh, inside and outside the Air Force, uh, it it you know we've been I think we've been criticized at times for uh, uh, not moving fast enough and uh, for not being innovative enough. Well, th th this is in part the answer to that, and part of it has been the fact that we've just we we've been we've been we've had ideas, we've done experiments, but we haven't committed. We haven't made the step to go forward and and change how we operate, and, and this is that. So uh, last B-21 question, are we going to get to see it next year? You're not going to get to see much of it because I've told you about all that's going to be publicly revealed. Uh, we don't want to give our enemies a head start in any of this, our potential enemies. So uh, we're, we're, we're going to acknowledge that we're doing this. Uh, let, let the public be aware of it. Let the Congress be aware of it. Uh, there'll be obviously more information at classified level, uh, but we're not going to say a lot more about what we're doing in the public. Okay, another classified one that you're probably not going to say much about, but uh, you are one of the people who is a driving force behind what's now called NGAD. What would you like to see from that initiative in, or that program in the coming years while you're secretary? Yeah, I put NGAD into the budget in about 2014, and we've awarded the contract before I left. Uh, I, I lost track of it because it was a special access program. Some of the ones I've been talking about was an acknowledged special access program. And we, you know, what we told people publicly was that it was a program to build essentially x planes, technology demonstrators to mature technology that would be the next generation after F-35, if you will. Uh, that program has moved forward uh, very well. And it is a feeder to both the NGAD platform, if you will, and the NGAD family of systems. I'm, I'm referring to NGAD more broadly. Next generation air dominance isn't just about the fighter plane after F-35 next generation or F-22. Next generation air dominance is about the system of systems uh, that's gonna give us dominance in the air collectively for the future generation, for the generation after F-35. And some of that, what we do there, I hope will be backward compatible as well and used with the systems that we're acquiring now and already have. I know you mentioned in your initial uh, uh, pr uh, priorities about um, moving targets and, and whatnot. Um, I, I, there's ABMS. It, uh, one, of, one of the things that's been talked about for a number of years now is whether or not the Air Force should buy Wedgetail. There you go. There's another connection to Australia. Uh, is, is that something still on the table or have, have it been moved on to, you know, set space or some other or drones, some other type of way? Uh, it, it is under consideration, the, uh, along with some other options. 
you know, b before I left, the Air Force was working on a program called uh, JSTARS Recap, which is a ground surveillance piece of this. And they've been thinking about the replacement for AWACS for some time. AWACS is a very old system now. It's been around since I think the 70s. So um, what do we do next, right? And one of the problems that those types of platforms have, they're basically large conventional aircraft with big radars on them that emit. Uh, is the, incre the increasing reach of standoff weapons to go back and try to attack those aircraft. During the, the Cold War, when we were contemplating buying J-STARS, we did a calculation of how many fighters it would take to penetrate deep enough with the air-to-air -air weapons of the time to attack J-STARS and kill it. Uh, that was the problem we gave the Soviets we, when we filled the J-STARS and AWACS. Uh, and it was a big number. It was a very large number. But our conclusion was that it was such a valuable target to them that they would probably spend that many fighters, if you will, trying to get the uh, uh, J-STARS and AWACS and kill them. Well, with the advancement in air-to-air -air missiles and ranges and uh, aerial surveillance from lots of things and the types of operations we had to fight, uh, the Air Force, after I left, made the decision that J-STARS wasn't survivable enough and it had to be canceled and replaced with something else. And we're coming up on the same situation in a way with AWACS. So something like Wedgetail would give us a much more modern capability and it would give us something to, to fill a gap temporarily while we figured out what to do longer term. So it's under consideration for those reasons. Um, but in general, I think we need to move towards more space-based capabilities, but there are some technological limitations there. And this is something we have to work very closely with the intelligence community. You know, the types of sensors we're talking about are traditionally in the U.S. anyway, uh, fielded by the intelligence community, but for a different purpose. They're fielded for the purpose of gathering intelligence and providing it to the National Command Authority. So I'm already entered into some conversations with the director of the NRO, and I'll be talking to the DNI about this. Uh, and, and hopefully we can work together uh, to work on the space-based side of that. Uh, the Air Force traditionally has had the airborne responsibilities for similar sensors. And so we'll be seeing what kind of a mix to, to satisfy both the air and ground to moving target uh, needs that we have will, will be the right mix to go forward with. So we're rapidly running out of time. So I want to try to incorporate maybe like five budget questions into, into one. Full year CR. It's a possibility, we, you know, the CR is uh, continuing resolution, which freezes spending at last year's levels through February. How much does that screw up what you want to actually accomplish moving forward? Totally. Uh, it's a devastating impact. The, the, I, I've been pretty vocal about this. I, I spoke about it at Reagan. The, the, you know, we, we got we've, we've gotten so we plan for a first quarter CR right now we're taking now we're taking a CR it's going to go into the middle of the second quarter. Uh, I had hoped that the CR that was passed and by the way I thank them for passing it and not shutting us down but it's a small victory to not shut down the government I would think in any event um, I was hoping they'd do a shorter CR than they actually did but I'm glad they did one and didn't disrupt us with, with a, even a short shutdown. Uh, but the longer you go the more impact it has. Um, you know, we do find ways to, and I, I made a mistake about this, Reagan, I'll correct now, we do find ways to pay people, all right? But the problem is, because we don't get more money to give them the raise, we have to take that money from somewhere else. So it means that people can't move, it means we can't recruit any people. We have to keep the whole civ pay thing below the cap that we have in the previous year. So the people we already have, we can give them a raise, but we can't bring new people in and pay them. So we, we find ways to manage our way through that and not uh, and be, and be true to our people. But the other effects, milk on projects that we can't do, uh, programs that are we can't start. For me, from the modernization perspective, that's the biggest impact. I can't start the new thing I need to do, so I lose all that time. And time's not recoverable. I can't get it back. Uh, you know, I've made the comment that we're in a race here, right? And it's a kind of an arms race in that we're trying to get better equipment uh, from our perspective than the other guys faster. And we're trying to defeat the things that they're fielding by doing countermeasures to them faster than, than they can respond. So there's definitely a race in that sense. Um, uh, it, it, it affects all of that. It, 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 it's wasteful. There are inefficiencies in our uh, profiles for our programs, which often go up over time to increase R&D spending or to increase procurement. So those are affected. Uh, it, it's, it's just generally a terrible way to run a railroad. And it's unnecessary. The Congress just needs to do its job and, and provide us with the uh, with appropriation space. So I, I want to, this will be the, my last question. Uh, you have, and I, I can think of every predecessor of yours I've covered back for the 16 years I've been uh, covering the Pentagon, has argued that the Air Force needs to retire planes to, modern, to be able to modernize. 
uh, what's what's the what's the argument you are bringing this time around as secretary? I think the uh, the first urgency of the threats we face. We got to get on with it. Um, yeah, that, that you asked me about parity. I gave you that long answer that didn't answer the question. The, it, you, we need to be very concerned about the pace at which China is modernizing. We need to be very concerned about their intentions. Uh, we don't know for sure if they have a timeline or not, but we do know what some of their ambitions are. And we do know that would be very inimical to U.S. interest. So we, we need to preserve deterrence over time. Uh, and if we don't we don't get on with the things that we need to do, we get a problem. An obstacle to getting on with things to do is freeing up resources by retiring our older equipment, uh, which is getting increasingly uh, expensive to maintain. The average age of an airplane in the United States Air Force is about 30 years. Yeah. Anybody driving a 30 year old car out there? I'm not. And so I, I think we need to you know, be realistic about what it takes. I know I understand the political uh, aspect of this and how important it is to people to maintain, you know, government presence and military presence in their the states and districts. But, you know, the first thing we owe our airmen and our guardians and all of our military people is the equipment they need to prevail. Now, that's the first thing we owe them. We've got to get that for them and give it to them and give them the resources so they can train and be ready. Uh, and if we force them to hang on to old equipment that may not really be applicable to the type of conflict we're most worried about, we're doing them a grave disservice. So unfortunately, we have to leave it there. Secretary Frank Kendall, thank you so much for joining us. To our viewers, please stay tuned for our final two sessions. Thank you.